I'm Nolan Kelly, Chief Customer Officer at One Up Health, and I'm excited to be joined today by Kevin Yamashita, our Senior Director of Customer Enablement. Yeah, really One pleased up. to be here. Thanks for joining us, Kev. Um, so, Kev, let's start with this title you're carrying here, this Customer mm -hmm. Enablement. It's sort of non-traditional title. W what are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all sorts of really cool things here at the organization. Customer enablement as a function is really a confluence of a couple of different things. At a very basic level, we're helping our customers to derive business value from their One Up Health Fire platform. Um, on some days, we're talking about business strategy and trying to define business values for decision makers in the C-suite. On other days, we're doing art of the possible demonstrations and proof of concept development to really, you know, find uh, where the rubber meets the road. But at the end of the day, you know, a lot of customers here at One Up Health came to us to solve a compliance problem. And we're trying to help them understand that with that existing investment they made, there's actually a lot of opportunity to revolutionize their business and really, you know, spy new value, new potential, new opportunity um, in their technology investment. Terrific. Yeah, I love it. And in Q2 of this year, um, Gartner actually released a study that said the interoperability investment decisions were being driven by the C-suite. So that's good news. Mm -hmm. um, and that those investments were really well aligned to the enterprise priorities. So I think risk adjustment, network design, um, value-based care programs, things like that. Uh, but at the same time, only 16% of health plans were seeing an ROI from their investment mm -hmm. in this interoperability initiatives. And that's a like, that strikes me as a real problem. So this, this customer enablement approach, right? It, it kind of designed to go right into that that challenge that the industry is facing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, let's let's be honest. I think in a lot of situations, people like to talk about interoperability and they like to champion it. But, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of folks are not willing to make the investments to actually solve the hard problems. Yeah. And for better or for worse, the government stepped in and really, you know, forced some folks' hands. So we have a lot of infrastructure now that didn't exist three, four, five years ago. Um, but one of the problems we see is a lot of organizations that went through a lot of these different machinations, they, they never really thought about how they would put these different pieces in place to solve higher order problems, yeah. right? It's kind of the same way that when your parents tell you to go exercise, you do, but you don't like it. And it's not until much later you realize that you're actually doing this for a purpose. And we're just trying to help people understand the joy of exercise, the joy of having this infrastructure in place um, to solve these novel problems that have you know, plagued the industry for decades. It's an uphill battle, the yeah. joy of exercise. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. sir. Um, I think we both know. We do. We do <laughs> both know, for sure. Uh, so, you know, you, you mentioned the, the regulation sort of compliance, and, and oftentimes we hear from our customers and the market that, uh, you know, this concept of interoperability for compliance, mm -hmm. right? And that's just a, mm -hmm. a very small piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. sort of why uh, this has all started, why there are such such universal investments in fire and APIs, you know, right now and that type of infrastructure, um, you know, but at the same time, there is this, rec should be this recognition that there is, for the first time in the history of, of this industry, really, we have modern tech stacks that exist at the provider and exist at the payer with a universal data model mm -hmm. and RESTful APIs. Like That should be transformative as we think about where this industry has been historically and needs to go in the future. It, it's incredible, right? For, for an industry that has been you know, mired in the past held back by, you know, legacy technology and bespoke custom processes um, and, and a lot of black boxes. For the first time, we're really seeing all of these other commercial technologies, all these other things that have powered the rest of the technology space. I mean, you know, fire is nothing more than, than JSON and REST APIs. These are technologies that fuel the internet revolution of the past 20 years. And just now we're seeing them, you know, injected in the healthcare arena. So the ability to take some of these tried and true digital transformation catalysts and really start to apply them to the healthcare problem, one of the most yeah. intractable problems of our you know, age, that, that's really exciting. But it really requires a different way about thinking, of thinking about what problems you're going to solve and how you're going to solve them. And I think that's where a lot of people struggle, right? They don't see that this is, this is not a one-off project. This is a long-term program of evolving businesses, evolving industries. And that's hard and that's scary. Um, but we're here to really help our customers figure out like how you take that first step yeah, because that's all it is. It's the first step and then another and then another. And then before you know it, you're running a marathon. Nice. Yeah, we talk about, uh, you know, making strategic, placing some strategic bets in in the future and in, in this transformation that that is enabled right now. Um, there is a bit of a sentiment that the the initial compliance push that Health Lens underwent was a bit of a tax on their businesses. Mm -hmm. Right. There wasn't a tremendous amount of value realized from those 
uh, those dollars spent in those projects that they went through. But we're also now looking at a next wave of regulations that are coming soon. And, and, and my sense is, I'm curious if you see the same way, my sense is that we're kind of beginning the shift from this mindset of a tax on the health plan to an investment now and how that investment can realize value uh, for that health plan. As we start to think about what historically for the last couple of years has been converting legacy systems to fire R4 and making that data available to leave the organization, we're moving to a world now where we're starting to talk about bringing external data mm -hmm. into the into the system and into the organization and putting that data to work for you. Does that yeah. resonate? Are you guys seeing the same thing? I think so, though. I, I would push back. I think the idea that, you know, compliance, you know, 1.0, if you will, is it a tax? Y yes and no, right? On, on one level, certainly it was some effort that all these organizations had to, you know, exert. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, as Gartner mentioned, the, the gains were, you know, mediocre at best for a lot of organizations. But I think what's really interesting about that is, is not necessarily that everyone was, was was taxed in a certain way, but everyone was forced to really think about what is the infrastructure of the future? And what I find really interesting and some of our forward-looking customers find really interesting is you now have kind of a level playing field, yeah. right? Everyone now has these base capabilities. So in some ways, it's a forcing function, right? It's an opportunity to say, okay, we are all here. How do we remain competitive? How do we think about this differently? How do we do things that our neighbors are not doing so that we can be unique? And then to your point, as we think about this next wave of regulation, that's really a matter of, okay, let's put these things to work, right? Yeah. Let's not just serve this data up, but let's transfer it. Let's move it. Let's actually try to solve some problems. Let's actively interoperate. And, and let's be clear, when we talk about interoperability, it's really two parts. It's the sharing of data. I think that's what a lot of people think about, but it's also the usage of that shared data. And I think now that's what we're seeing. Step one was get the data. Mm -hmm. Step two is send and use the data. And, you know, if there's a little bit of a tax we have to pay to actually be able to change the way the fabric of this industry works, yeah. you know, I think we owe it to ourselves and all of our, you know, other human beings in this country to do that. Well said. Noble. It's a noble cause. We talk <laughs> at one up about helping to enable a societal change mm -hmm. in healthcare, right? And and really the data portability is at the center of, of that happening um, to help bring healthcare to where the other industries have gone through a lot of the change of, of this modern internet economy. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, what we're all seeing in the, the 21st century is that data really fuels revolution, right? In, in so many ways, the literal ways, the meta, meta, metaphorical ways. Um, but when we talk about healthcare, certainly we've never really been able to say, here's what I pay and here's the quality of what I'm getting. Mm -hmm. And there is different things we put in place to try to weave around the edges of that, but to really cut to the core of that is what we're talking about right now. And that, that's really exciting. Nice. All right, well, let's let's pivot there. Let's cut to the core. There are some, there are some cool things that mm -hmm. um, I know our customers are doing. I know your team mm -hmm. plays a big, a big role in this value realization of the investments that, that some of these customers have made. Mm -hmm. uh, so why don't we start with, a, I know there's a, a, a call it mid-sized regional health plan that is leaning into use cases well up far and you know above and beyond what they're doing for for compliance. Yeah. Um, do you want to help us sort of under, set the context of what they're up to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, what, one of the customers I have in mind they are a mid-sized health plan in the the New England area, and what I think is really interesting is you know because they're mid-sized in New England, they're really trying to punch above the weight class. Right. There's a lot of big dogs in in, in this arena. Um, so this is a customer that, that does not have excess resources to spend frivolously. Right. They have to make their bets. They have to be really thoughtful and double down where they think they can actually get some returns. But they can't you know, they, they can't be wishy washy. Yeah. Right. And whenever we talk about placing bets and doubling down, if you're not using data to inform those decisions, I don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Right. That's just a gamble. Right. Um, so, you know. What we start to think about here is, well, how do I get the data to make the better decisions? How do I start to ask the better questions? Because it becomes a feedback loop. As you get more data, you know where to look. As you start to look in those places, you get better data. You make better decisions. You ask better questions. You iterate on top of that. And I think that's one of the things that's really exciting about this, this mid-sized payer market, right, is they understand where they can push and where they're better and where they can be more agile, frankly, mm -hmm. than a lot of their, their larger competitors. And we're really starting to see, like I said before, People saying, well, if everyone has these capabilities, how do I make them special for me? What do I know about my organization? Why are we unique? Where do we like to push? Um, and in particular, what we're seeing a lot is, you know, folks really thinking about ACO relationships and value-based contracting, mm. right? 
you know, this is obviously, you know, the next push to try to realize, you know, higher quality care at lower cost. Um, but I think one of the challenges that a lot of, you know, one-up customers face is that as they get into these ACO relationships and they write these value-based contracts, it's really hard to know, well, what are the outcomes going to be? Yeah. What is the performance of this arrangement when it comes time to recontract and to negotiate? Like, what do we do? What do we say? How do we make it defensible? The data doesn't exist. And when the data does exist, the payers and the providers can't agree on what that data is or what it says. Different formats, different timeframes. So the idea that now we can reach in and have fire consistently across different continuums of care in all these different environments that we can all point to and say, this is real. This is true. We can agree on this. You have to start from that kernel of truth, yep. that shared understanding. Otherwise, the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. No, I love that you went right to the, the ACO uh, relationship. CMS had said they want 100% of Medicare beneficiaries yeah. in a value-based care yeah. contract you know, by 2030. And that's not that far away, right? No. Um, which is a little scary. But uh, but you know, the, the only way that that will be successful is if you do have this ability to get out of how things have worked historically, proprietary data models, flat mm -hmm. file exchange mm -hmm. over SFTP, and start to really light up data on demand in, in, in this sort of computable you know, manner. Yeah, and is that data on demand, you hit the nail on the head right there. Right. The the issue is not that the data doesn't exist. Right. The data does exist. And, you know, we can argue about different formats and different transfer mechanisms and all those things. And don't get me wrong, that's that's a drain on, you know, IT departments across the country. But one of the things I really want to zero in on is, is data on demand, because I think the timeliness of fire data, that's a game changer. Yeah. Right. Think about the traditional way that payers and providers work together. You know, a payer is just kind of sitting there waiting and maybe they find out about something that happened 30 days ago. 45 days ago, yep. 90 days ago, well, after 90 days, it's too late to really be thinking about, you know, transitions of care. It's too late to be thinking about steerage and referrals and network leakage. But gosh, the fact that we can get this data in real time as these encounters close with an unbelievable amount of richness and accessibility and computability, it's a game changer. Yeah, for sure. Let's stay on this, this, this mid-market health plan. Uh, I was on the phone yesterday with uh, an employee of a very large health plan, mm -hmm. and um, I'll paraphrase, but but one of the lines he said was that our stability is one of the most limiting aspects of our organization right now. And so I took from that that we like to talk about change, but we don't necessarily need to change. Mm -hmm. We're a very stable organization. If you're if you're in that mid you know mid market segment, are you? the change agent of the industry? Is that where we're going to see change driven? I, I think you have to be. I think you have to be. And there, there's a couple different reasons for that. One, like we talked about before is, you know, if, if you are not a big dog, then you have to be agile, right? Like you yeah. have to find that opportunity around the edges just because of the way that the, the market dynamics work. Yeah. But another thing that I think is really interesting is if you are not as large, not as stable, that means you really need to be more thoughtful about your book of business. Um, that's who you are insuring. It is the premiums that you're charging, right? And, you know, historically, it has been really difficult to model future expenditures, yeah. right? Understanding, do I have a large population of individuals that are going to experience heart disease or diabetes in the next 5, 10, 15 years? Do I have a large influx of folks that are going to be aging into Medicare plans that maybe have not been in? How do I think about what that, that population looks like? Um, the ability to actually model those things, especially for a mid-market plan, is really, really important as you think about your financials. You just don't have, you know, generally speaking, um, that much buffer, right? Yeah. Um, but with FIRE and the richness of this data, we're starting to see the ability for folks to actually look at different data elements, clinical data elements, lab values, social determinants of health. Those are all really important things for trying to project future cost. Yeah. Uh, last question, just on, on this particular customer that you're thinking of, you know, in order for an organization, especially, you know, one in the segment to make investments on whether it's, you know, process redesign or, or, you know, a new way of acquiring mm -hmm. and, and exchanging data elements, it has to be tied to some tangible business value. Mm -hmm. you, you have to get from that 84% uh, who aren't realizing value uh, to the 16% who are. And, and I'm just curious, where are they focused? Like, what are they looking at as they think about the opportunity yeah. in front of them? I think, I think that's a great question. You know, it's, it's funny because we, you know, here at One Up Health, we're a, we're a technology company, right? Which means that we have developers and we use terms like agile and fail fast and all these right. things. And I, I think in some ways, you know, the same way that fire is allowing us to take the best technologies of the rest of, you know, 
the, the tech space and apply them to healthcare, we need to be taking the best thinking from outside healthcare and applying it to healthcare. And what I mean by that is, you know, really looking for those quick, easy wins, that low hanging fruit. You know, in the agile methodology, we always talk about finding ways to deliver business value, right? We should be doing things that actually show value, even if marginal and incremental. And that's what we're really seeing in the, the space with our, our payer customers is trying to say, okay, well, I know there are 700 things I want to change. I know we have all these pain points, right? But what are two things that I can change in the next month that move the needle by 0.05%? Yep. Because again, it's that first step. If you haven't done 100 pushups before, you don't start by doing 100 pushups. <laughs> you start by doing one. And listen, that first one, it might suck. Yep. But then the next day you do two. It's the same thing. It's trying to find areas in your business process where you can make incremental change. But the last thing I think I want to leave you with, because this is really important, and this is what our, our most forward-thinking you know, customers you know, really recognize, this is not a technology problem. Right. The technology is easy. Yeah. And it's not. It takes time and effort and all these things. But at the end of the day, this is a people problem. It's a business process problem. Right. And I yeah. think if we look inside ourselves, we understand, again, in this 21st century age we live in, no, the tech is there to solve so many things, but it's how I use it. Mm -hmm. It's what problems I solve. It's what I choose to do when. It's how I convince other people to come on this journey with me. That's the hardest thing. So we're always pushing our customers, think about change management, right? Think about identifying that business value, finding other folks that are advocates, evangelists, really building camaraderie and excitement, energy. Yeah. It's all those intangible things. The human psyche gets in the way of so much. It does. I'd go even a step further, not just a people problem, it's a political problem. There are, you, know, you could question, do health plans and providers really want to share data? Oh, I question people? every day. Right. I know. Yeah. We see the yeah. momentum of it. Um, and so that's why it's so interesting that you went to the, the ACO and value-based mm -hmm. care, because there you have contracts that are designed to be, not to say they always are, but designed to be aligned on an incentive model. And in order to perform the right way, measure success and understand how you're how you're you know performing against those those contracts you need to have an aligned data set so yeah i think so you know i, th I think about this a lot because there's so much negativity sometimes towards payers and providers um and you know i, I think that's misplaced yeah but right? i think we're all genuinely good people that work in this industry because we want to make a, a real difference and make the world a better place and sometimes you just get so caught up in the details right like i would push everyone to really think about you know Again, how do I make this 2% better? Yeah. Why am I doing what I do? And how do I get other people to not lose sight of that? Because as soon as you find that, that nugget of excitement, it's infectious. Awesome. Let's, uh, let's pivot. So um, went from the sort of mid-size payer. Who else are you working with? What's another example of something that our customers are doing in the market that you think is changing a little bit of the game? Yeah. So another you know, customer I'm thinking about is a, a state Medicaid agency that we work with. Right. Um, you know, Medicaid organizations also have fire compliance requirements yep. um, sitting on the other side of some of the, the commercial payers. And, you know, I, I think Medicaid is a really interesting space. Right. Um, we see a lot of variety in the way that Medicaid is administered across the country. We see a lot of variability in the different states. The one customer that I'm thinking about um, comes from a state where more than 25 percent of the population is on Medicaid. Um, you know, it's a relatively large state. So there's a lot of complexity in delivering care. And that makes it really difficult for you know, a government agency to provide the best care possible. Yeah. Right. We're dealing with limited resources, um, both financially and in terms of just provider capabilities. We're dealing with very complicated, you know, sets of medical problems. In many cases, it's not just medical problems. It's that concept of social determinants of health we talked about. And I'm really excited this keeps coming up again, because at the end of the day, um, the same way that this is a people problem, not a technology problem, I think sometimes the, the medical details, they're actually kind of figured out. Yeah. Like we know that people need to get screened for cancer. We know that if you are at risk for, you know, heart disease, there are certain things that we can do. But gosh, why are people not making those simple choices? A lot of really legitimate factors not related to healthcare, but related to what? Social determinants of health. Yeah. We have a, a tremendous partnership here with a company called Gainwell Technologies, mm -hmm. and it's um, uh, it's allowed us to be the fire, one of health to be the fire data platform for today, 20 uh, state Medicaid agencies. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's a, I think to your point, just like a, a really critical piece of the market. Mm -hmm. It's a really important piece of our business. And as we think about going back to enabling societal change, the Medicaid, the Medicaid market, the Medicaid population is 
primed to to you know benefit the most from this type of transformation of the data space. Truly, truly. And again, I, I go back to this idea that you know why do we do this? But it's it's to make the world better. It's to right. help people that need help. It's to take care of our brothers and our sisters. And I think that you know in these ways, this is another example where we can really use technology to try to help people do the right thing. And by people, I'm talking about all the people involved in continuum of care, right? You know, transitions of care, gaps in care, some of these really basic things come to mind, right? Um, disease management, I think, is another really good example, right? Mm -hmm. We know there are populations of people that have chronic disease. We know that those with chronic disease, you know, are a, a disproportionate amount of the healthcare expenditure in the country. Like, what do we do about that? And how do we think about this, not just in terms of an economic problem, but really a societal and equity problem. Yeah. Right. And that's really interesting because data can change the way that we solve these problems. It means we can apply our resources in a more thoughtful way. Yep. It means we can be more responsive. It means we can make data-driven decisions. We can have better contracts, not just between payers and providers, but maybe third-party organizations that help us to provide some of this care. We can hold people accountable. We can ask the better questions. Um, you know, all of these are things that we could not do before. And again, because we're using technology that is, you know, tried, true, tested, commercial, off the shelf, it means that these state agencies that have limited resources, really, you know, um, lean IT departments, they can do a lot more with a lot less. Yeah. And to your point before, it's not about new data per se. The data is accessible. Mm -hmm. The problem is it's accessible through manual processes or through paper trails or faxes or flat files that are, are you know, made accessible yeah. once every 30, 45, 60 days. And that really is what drags the industry on the inefficiency there and the lost opportunity by not having data on demand through automated process. Truly. Right? That's I, the opportunity. Truly, truly. I mean, so many of these systems are, are brittle. And I mean, both the, the IT systems and the company and people process systems. And one of the problems is that as soon as you have these brittle systems, if you see a failure in one or two points, you lose confidence in the system. Right. And again, it's human psychology, right? As soon as you lose confidence in the system, you don't buy in as much. Yeah. And if you don't buy in as much, your partners <laughs> don't buy in as much because the system starts to fail and it all just, it crumbles. Yeah. So this is about, you know, not only trying to fix some of these problems, but trying to fix them in sustainable, scalable ways where we can build faith that, you know, if people commit, if they stack their hands and we're all in this together, we can actually make a difference because nobody wants to stack their hands by themselves. Right. Um, but I think this is an opportunity for us to come together from all different parts of the healthcare care continuum to really solve these problems in novel, interesting, and sustainable ways. So if, if that example is of a Medicaid agency making their data accessible to their business partners, mm -hmm. um, another play on that is is – where you're the vendor. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have uh, many customers across many different segments. I'm thinking of one who's in the, the clinical research space and mm -hmm. their, mm -hmm. their entire business relies on the acquisition of, of clinical records, right? Of, of charts mm -hmm. from the various providers who, who provide the important clinical services to, to their patients. Um, and, and that model has always been a very manual mm -hmm. labor intensive model there's there's challenges of authorization um and now for the first time thanks to a lot of the regulations from onc of making uh, fire r4 apis and bulk apis a requirement for your onc certified emrs these types of organizations can rethink how they acquire data and then when that data comes in what they what they do with it right in the sort of at the resource level their ability to run inclusion exclusion criteria mm -hmm. power their own products and their own analytics not saying that every system is now on a completely level playing field but but moving to uh rest apis and having the the, the fire data format uh really has enabled that organization to change how how they acquired it and, and operate on that data. yeah i think about this a lot it, it, it's funny one of the first part-time jobs i had was working at a doctor's office. And I, I did this just for one summer, um, but they were trying to digitize, yeah. which means that I sat in a closet and I took paper charts and fed them into a scanner. And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, well, gosh, this is, this is silly because no one is ever going to actually look at these scan documents. Of course, they were doing it to preserve the records and to make sure that they were in compliance with you know, all the different policies for data retention. But, but what really struck me was the idea that you know, for a long time, if you wanted to do any research on clinical data, what did you do? You sent 10 temp workers to a closet 
and you opened up every chart one by one and you yeah. scanned through to try to find the thing you were looking for. So if you're looking for, you know, particular you know, procedures or diagnoses, what, what a slow, laborious process. And of course, one turn of the crank is now we have these electronic medical records. So now what do we do? Well, 10 years ago, five years ago, we sent someone to the hospital and they sat in a closet and they logged out of the computer and did the same dang thing. And just now, just now, we're starting to see the ability to actually reach in, pull all this information out in a structured, consistent way where we can, like you said, do advanced inclusion and exclusion logic. Right. And, and one of the problems is I think, you know, in the past, because it was so much work to find some data, we missed a lot of the other data because, again, it comes back to equity, right? Making sure that we have everybody's record. But in many cases, you know, the folks whose records are available are not always consistent based on the providers they see, the types of providers they see, urgent care, ER, PCPs, how many people are going to see specialists for issues versus their PCP because they can't go to a specialist. We're suddenly seeing the ability to actually pull all this together in a much more centralized way. So not only is it easier to get the data, but it's a better data set and it's you know simpler to leverage for the advanced big data capabilities that everybody wants to lean into. Okay, that like you nailed it. We should close on this because that is like the perfect you know summary of the opportunity, right? Absolutely. And I think how we should all be thinking about the opportunity. This is this first wave of regulations where health plans were required to transform to fire and make the data accessible. I stand on my soapbox. You know this that that says the it, it, CMS did not necessarily do that. My words, my my viewpoint <laughs> did not necessarily do that thinking that everyone would run and, and go retrieve their mm -hmm. claims history mm -hmm. and bring it onto their smartphone. They did it to push the foundation and the rails across every health plan in the country so that the infrastructure was in place that maps to the EMRs and now allows this richness of data to flow on demand. Absolutely. Process redesign. I'm glad that you said rails because the analogy I always like to make is that, you know, the government said that we had to lay this rail across the country, connecting payers and providers. And they only mandated that folks be able to put one tiny little hand cranked car right. running between Chicago and St. Louis. But that wasn't the point. The point was that, you know, the most entrepreneurial, the most forward thinking could load up huge long trains of freight and send those between all these different cities. That's really the game. That's what this rail is for. That's what this infrastructure is for. So now it's just a matter of which plans, which providers are going to do that and how they're going to change the world. Love it. Love it. Love it. There's a reason you're doing this customer enablement stuff. I mean, you're, you, you kind of you ooze the uh, the desire to help push change across the industry. Well, it's, it's exciting, right? We, we've lived with this mediocrity for so long. Yeah. If we don't do this, then who will? All right. Thanks, Kev. Appreciate it. Nolan, Thanks it's always a pleasure. All right. We'll see you, man. Cheers. Thank you.